this video we're going to be discussing the Renaissance and Baroque era, primarily looking at the artists who made these periods happen. To kind of get oriented, let's see where we came from. The Greeks idealized the physical form, whereas the Romans shifted, focusing on physical accuracy, even including flaws. Then in the Middle Ages, the dimensional space kind of collapses and we see the spiritual concerns being more important than physical existence. And the Renaissance brings us right back down to Earth, where we have Christian subjects in human terms. So to go a little bit more in depth, Renaissance literally means rebirth, and as such, it was a revival of the Greek and Roman classical period, occurring early 15th to early 17th century. There was a surge in humanism during this time, which was a philosophical, artistic, and literary movement in which logic and observation challenged the religious shift we saw in the Middle Ages. As such, there was an interest in science and rationality. Artists were utilizing knowledge about anatomy, light, geometry, linear perspective, all conventions grounded in science that they used on their art. It was more of a focus on human questions, not divine questions. Another shift we see is that artists went from being anonymous workers like they were in the Middle Ages to being seen as individual creative geniuses. Yet another change is that nude figures became a major subject in art during this time, representing the immortal soul, whereas the few that existed in the Middle Ages portrayed shame and lust. And while the Renaissance was happening as one movement, there were differences in the influences on the North and in the South of Europe. For instance, the North was impacted by Byzantine and classical influences, where the South was more focused on the Gothic influences. In addition, the North converted from nature-centric religions to Christianity, but the South grew out of the classical Mediterranean traditions. So starting with our first artist, who is really a proto-Renaissance, more like the late Middle Ages, we have Giotto, who is an Italian painter. We can see the medieval characteristics of his artwork because the characters are not totally dimensional, they're still a little bit flat, almost like relief sculptures. Yet he diverges from the more abstract style because there is more dimension, there's more light and space and layering of objects and people. There's also a much greater emphasis on feelings and emotive expressions. Looking at this detail shot of the lamentation, we can see all of the different characters grieving in different ways. In doing this, he's becoming the reinventor of naturalistic painting. He's bringing more life and expression and dynamicism back into the figure. Then we move into the early Renaissance, which was happening in Italy. There was a flourishing economy that was backdropped by a chaotic political setting. During the Renaissance, patronage was a major part of the art world. It was the financial support from rich patrons, which were people funding the arts, that basically made being an artist a job. Some of these patrons would be merchants or nobles, church officials, or bankers, like the Medici family. When patrons commissioned religious pieces, they were often depicted in the works themselves as devout Christians which was a way to prove their faith and immortalize them in the art while also supporting the church. In this example, the Holy Trinity, we see primacy of place at work, which means that the higher a subject is in the composition, the more important that they are. As we see here, it's titled the Holy Trinity, so you have the Trinity at the top. As depicted from top down, you have Father or God, then you have the Dove, which is the Holy Spirit, and Christ, which is the Son on the cross. Then you have Mary and St. John in the, the next tier. And in the bottom, in the very front, kind of existing in the same plane as the viewer, we have the patrons who commissioned the piece. And while they're in the same image, they are fairly distanced from the people that are more important to their religion. In addition, they're devoutly praying. They're not participating. They're more worshiping. So this piece was created by Masaccio, who was an Italian painter. Again, it's titled The Holy Trinity, and it's actually the first painting to use systemic linear perspective, with the vanishing point being kind of at the bottom of the cross, near where the viewer's eye level would be. Following both the sight lines of the figures and the architecture, there's a lot of implied lines pointing at the Trinity. This painting also has the figures drawn as if they were clothed nudes, so the drapery really realistically looks like it's hanging off of forms instead of just being flat drapery. At the bottom of this piece is the inscription, What you are, I once was, what I am, you will be. This is an example of a memento mori, 
which means remember that you must die. In this context, it's in terms of being a devout Christian, referencing the judgment found in the afterlife. Next we have Donatello, who was a sculptor. This was the first life-size freestanding sculpture of the Renaissance, and it's a depiction of David, the biblical symbol of resistance from foreign domination and stronger enemies. Here he's depicted very young, whereas other artists depict him more as a young adult with defined musculature. He looks even younger and smaller in comparison to Goliath's head beneath his foot. At the time of his creation, this sculpture was actually fairly controversial because of the sensuous pose and the choice of selective clothing. The figure is nude, but still wears a hat and boots. Also, most three-dimensional forms that stand in contraposto are going to need support on that weight-bearing leg. And here we actually see a feather from Goliath's helmet going up the back of David's leg. And while this was formally meant to solve a technical problem to logistically make the sculpture stand, the feather goes up fairly high on David's inner thigh, which becomes further problematic when we see how young David is depicted here. And it was privately commissioned by the Medici family. Setting aside the controversy, this is a great example of Greek ideals of humanity combined with naturalistic Christian subjects. Next we have Botticelli, who did The Birth of Venus which itself was the first large mythical painting since classic antiquity. We can see the Byzantine influences with the decorative flat background and the figures that almost look like relief sculptures, not fully three-dimensional. Again, this was a Medici commission, and they thought that art could be uplifting and beautiful without specifically being about Christianity. Still, at this time it was novel to put a nude, a non-Christian goddess, centered compositionally, where audiences expected to see Christ or Mary. Against we're seeing the marriage of different cultures where this has classical Greek idealization alongside Renaissance focus on thoughts and feelings. So the Renaissance peaked about 1490 to 1525 in what was called the High Renaissance. This was in Florence, Rome, Venice, with the major artists being da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. These artists maintained calm, balanced, and idealized styles, and they also utilized a combination of Christianity, science, and Greek philosophy. Though there were far less, there were female artists in the Renaissance. They just had to find access to art education. Usually that was done by being a nun, having an exceptional education as a noblewoman, or being in the family of an artist. So the first artist we're going to talk about in the High Renaissance is da Vinci. And, as we all know, this is his Mona Lisa. We all recognize the strange landscape and the faint smile, but in addition, there's also a sense of atmosphere created by chiaroscuro, which is hazy light quality and soft blurred edges that da Vinci invented. It's also important to note that this was a portrait of an individual, and while this was common in ancient Rome, it was basically unheard of in the Middle Ages. But the humanism of the Renaissance believed that an individual could be worthy of a portrait by focusing in and immortalizing their humanity. Da Vinci sought knowledge through observation, and he did so using art and science. He kept journals of his research, both with notes and drawings, most of which were plans and schematics for mechanical devices that he wanted to make or there were anatomical studies that he took from observing dissected bodies. Now, initially when he started dissecting bodies, it was done illegally, until he got permission from the Catholic Church in order to create scientific sketches for medical uses. While people really didn't like the way he was going about it, what he learned and what he published was extremely helpful for medicine moving forward. In this example here, the fetus in the womb, there's only a few errors even compared to today's knowledge. Another very famous painting, we have The Last Supper. This painting also utilized one-point perspective in a really accurate way. Also, all of the lines converge at the vanishing point that is actually right behind Jesus' head. So all of the architectural lines are pointing toward the focal point, which is the Christ figure, who himself has the implied lines of a triangle, representing stability, but also the Trinity which is again reflected in the three windows behind his head. In previous depictions of Jesus, we see him among celestials, angels, his saintly mother, but here we see him among people, 
He's sitting with the disciples, just eating dinner. So the context here is much more approachable and accessible. Next, we move on to Michelangelo, who was an Italian painter and sculptor. His works emphasized the Renaissance humanist concept of God as an idealized but rational man who actively tends to every aspect of creation, particularly the humans, which is again interweaving what is divine with what is human. In this example, we see another depiction of David from the Bible, yet this one stands at 17 feet tall. Also, unlike the previous version, David hasn't killed Goliath yet. He has the stone in one hand and the slingshot in the other, and he's focused before the fight. In the previous example, we saw that David had already killed Goliath because he was standing on his head. This David also looks older than the previous because of his body shape and muscle definition. Another very famous work is the Sistine Chapel, which was commissioned by Pope Julius II. It's sectioned into three zones that feature the creation of the world from the book of Genesis. The highest level is the creation of humans with the famous God and Adam, which we see a portion of right here. And in the lower levels, we see prophets, sibyls, and groups of Old Testament figures. In line with what we've seen from the Renaissance already, we're again emphasizing the relationship between religious themes and realistic portrayals of humans that are based on scientific knowledge of anatomy. On the left here, we see a portion of the Sistine Chapel, and on the right, we see the full scene of God and Adam. The Sistine Chapel was created as frescoes, which is a mural painted directly onto the wall, and it's covered in wet plaster, so as the plaster dries, the pigments dry into the surface of the wall. And everywhere that you see paint, ceilings, wall, everything, Michelangelo painted it as a fresco. Next we have Raphael who is also an Italian painter, he was focused on clarity and balance. Here we see the School of Athens, which was an expression of humanist ideals. It depicts ancient Greeks in a philosophical discussion, which represents the development of human reason. It's also a complex composition that's divided into symmetrical subgroups. They're all surrounding the central figures of Plato and Aristotle which is another example of using the composition and architecture to create focal points and places of emphasis, but in a different way than what we've seen. There's no perspectival lines pointing to them, just framing them. Moving from Italy to the Netherlands, we have Van Eyck, who was also a painter. He was one of the first to use oil as a painting medium. He was known for his use of design principles, composition, and extreme minute detail that gave his works a believable presence. In doing this, it created the concept of painting as a window into a world similar to ours that became popularized during this time. Next we have Dürer, who is a German printmaker and painter. He combines symbolism with detailed realism. He borrowed from the traditions of Van Eyck while injecting them into nearly every form of printmaking. When he visited Italy, he saw a lot of new techniques that he decided to innovate upon. It also changed his idea of his position as the artist. As a result, he created a series of portraits that often portrayed subjects, particularly himself, face to face with the viewer. This is a pose that was typically reserved for portraits of Christ, not artists or just ordinary people. Durer is reiterating his challenge to this convention by painting himself in a popular imagery associated with Christ. On to Peter Bruegel, who was a Dutch Flemish printmaker and painter. He had a broad sense of position and spatial depth, which he utilized in genre paintings. These focused on the lives and surroundings of common people, which actually became his signature subject matter. This is the continued focus of the human rather than the divine. This example, Hunters in the Snow, represents peasants hunting in the forest. These illusions of deep space were a mix of Italian innovations along with the inspiration he found from his journeys throughout the Alps. Moving on to the late Renaissance, which occurred in the later 16th century, architects are starting to rethink and extend on classical conventions while still using their forms. For instance, we have Pier Palladio, who was an Italian architect. Here we see his Villa Rotonda, which is a reinterpretation of the Roman pantheon. It has four identical sides built around a central domed hall. While livability wasn't its main concern, it didn't really matter because it was designed for a retired nobleman. 
anyone who visited this building would have views from all four sides. Also in the late Renaissance, we see Veronese, who is an Italian painter. The painting depicted here is titled The Feast in the House of Levi. It was commissioned by monks to depict the Last Supper, but upon seeing the finished product, it was suspected of heresy because the surrounding figures were drunk and vulgar. It wasn't depicted like they thought it would be, like it was described in the Bible. The artist was actually brought before the Inquisition and ordered to change the work to be more biblically accurate. However, the artist decided to stick with his original vision, and he ended up just changing the name so it wouldn't be the Last Supper, thus confronting and basically solving his charge of heresy. After the Renaissance, many people thought that painting had been perfected, that it had peaked. But many artists revolted against this. They didn't want to keep doing the balanced classicism of the High Renaissance. They wanted to change things and go for more mannered expressions. Though the works that came out of mannerism looked quite similar to the Renaissance, they were a little more artificial and strange and less naturalistic. The figures were a little elongated and in more awkward poses. In this example, Moses defending the daughters of Jethro, the composition is really just a confused pile of flesh. There's not a lot of place to rest your eye. There's just so much happening. Spatially, it's really compressed and tangled, and there's a lot of foreshortening, which places the viewer more in the scene. Foreshortening happens when an object or subject is coming at the viewer, so what's closer seems much larger as the object recedes back into space. Next, we're moving on to the Baroque period, which happened about 1600 to 1750. During the Baroque period, Renaissance techniques were used, but with more energy and emotions. There was a lot more dramatic lighting, scale, and composition. Baroque paintings utilized curves, counter curves, sharp diagonals, and extreme foreshortening. It often did this with extreme drama, even for the sake of being lurid or grotesque, which we see on the left here. In Artemisia's Judith and the Maidservant with the Head of Holofernes. These styles were spawned and promoted by the Counter-Reformation, which was the Roman Catholic response to the Protestant Reformation. By depicting these stories in really dramatic ways, church leaders hoped to excite their members and intrigue them, especially those that couldn't read, as they could experience the story visually with these paintings. Italian painter Caravaggio is known for the dramatic lighting we see here, and that we saw in the previous painting. While the previous example was actually painted by Artemisia, her father, who was also an artist, was greatly influenced himself by Caravaggio. As we see in this example here, the conversion of St. Paul, there's a vivid lifelike quality that is meant to heighten the religious experience by giving the viewers a visceral portal into this story. And Caravaggio does this by using an extreme chiaroscuro, there's also foreshortening in the figure that's on the ground that puts him more in the plane of the viewer, which is again inviting them into the story and asking them to engage. In addition to his usual intensification of the subject, the lighting also imitates the blinding flash that Paul experiences in this conversion story. Another Italian Baroque artist working primarily in sculpture is Bernini. On the left here, we see yet another depiction of David this is life-size, not monumental, and again, it's putting the viewer into the action of the scene. It's inviting them in by placing them in the same plane. The figure is also a lot more dynamic with a twisted form and more diagonal lines. On the right-hand side, we see the Ecstasy of St. Teresa, another life-size depiction for the same purpose. This sculpture shows the saint being stabbed in the heart with a flaming arrow and her expression is that of pain and of joy. As a result, her body and her expression are more contorted and awkward and emotive and dramatic rather than the calm and relaxed style of the Renaissance. Moving on to the Flemish painter Peter Paul Rubens, this is his work, The Raising of the Cross. It's actually the center panel of a triptych that was produced for a cathedral. There's a major diagonal going on in this composition, and it pulls the viewer's eye from the bottom of the cross all the way up to Jesus' face, where there's the highest contrast. And in the Baroque fashion, we see high detail, lots of action and drama, and it's very visually dynamic. 
During this time, the Netherlands gained their independence, so during the Baroque period, there was a new wealthy class of patrons that emerged. They invested in landscapes, still life, genre scenes, and portraits. In this setting, we find Dutch painter and printmaker Rembrandt. Here we see pictured his piece, Return of the Prodigal Son, where he uses traditional Baroque lighting that's high contrast for a great sense of depth, which is also found in his etchings. And there's also the high detail which we see in the ragged clothes of the son, or in the gentle expression of the father hugging him. Dutch painter Vermeer created genre paintings. In doing this, he elevated ordinary life and ordinary actions to being worthy of the subject of a painting. Unlike his Baroque contemporaries, he didn't use really high contrast and really deep shadows. Instead, he had a great understanding of light and how it functioned in correlation to color. And in doing so, he captured their vitality and vibrancy, doing just what he set out to do, elevating the ordinary and showing how beautiful it already is. Here we see a Spanish Baroque painting by the artist Velazquez. Again, following Baroque traditions, we see high contrast, great sense of space, and high detail. But what sets this painting apart is its unclear subject. Initially, we're confused because the artist himself is actually in the painting. He's the leftmost figure. We can see the painting itself as well, sitting in front of him. Then we assume the little girl, who's in the center and has the highest contrast, is the main subject. Then our eye travels back to the next point of high contrast, the figure in the doorway. And finally, we see the royal couple in the mirror reflected behind the girl's head to the left. In creating this kind of illusionistic space, it reaches a depth beyond the frame, like a window into another world. A final period is the Rococo, which happened in the mid-18th century, centered in France. It utilized decorative elements with delicate details which was suited for the extravagant and often frivolous life of the French court and aristocracy. The Rococo captured the movement and light of the Baroque, but in a much more light-hearted and playful, romantic version of life that was free from hardship. In this example, Happy Accidents of the Swing, we see that this woman is swinging and her shoe flies off, headed straight for the man below her, giving the piece a sense of playful levity. The composition is also off-balance, following the diagonal lines that the Baroque utilized, while also employing high-contrast directional light. Technically, these movements were following some of the same conventions. However, the tone and attitude and subject matter were very different. So what? Why does this matter? Well, outside of giving the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles great namesakes, one thing I will note from this lecture is that throughout my studies in art history, very few times did I learn about female Renaissance artists, and they definitely existed. Artemisia still today is getting credited for things that were miscredited to male artists. And I find studying this period incredibly important because when people think about art or art history or museums, they often think about the Renaissance or the Baroque and these artists. So, on one hand, it matters who we talk about because we're forming the way people think about our history. And on the other hand, it also brings up the topic of why is this what we think of when we think of art? Which, in itself, is a criticism of the Western canon and how it's controlled most of art history. Another important thing about this lesson and the artists that we talked about is the comparisons between them. We could look at different time periods and places and the things that they were focused on, or we could track a singular character like David and see how different people from different regions or different time periods or movements or media depicted this narrative about David and Goliath. The interesting example we're going to talk about for this video is the Mona Lisa's twin. So when da Vinci was painting the Mona Lisa, he was not alone. He actually was surrounded by his pupils who were also there painting the same woman, an example of which we can see on the left. This, quote, twin of the painting looks different because it was restored, whereas da Vinci's version was not. How do you respond to the work with these new colors? Also consider why conservators would or would not want to restore da Vinci's version. A main concern is who would want to mess up one of the most famous works of art ever. But to expand the topic, what are the ethics of restoration in general? Should audiences see work as it ages naturally or as the artist originally intended? 
Is the restoration worth the risk of damage? Is there a point of too much restoration where the original work is lost? If something is damaged and you gradually replace the pieces on it, and eventually you replace every piece, even though it looks the same, is it the same as the original or is it something new? At what point do these new additions create a different work altogether? Or do we see it more as a collaborative piece? While we're preserving the past, we're also making additions in the present that themselves could even be analyzed by future researchers. And on that note, I'm going to conclude this video. Be sure to stay safe, get enough sleep, be kind to yourself, and I will see you all in class.